everybody, welcome to Central. Whether you're here in person or watching online, we are so glad you're joining us. There's all kinds of great stuff happening at Central. Here's a quick look at what we've got going on. Keep up with everything we have going on at Central, just visit our info page or find us on social media. If you're looking for a way to get plugged in at Central, just visit our website or stop at the welcome desk after the service. We're so glad you've chosen to join us today. Thanks for being here. All right, good morning, Central family. Good morning, good morning. So good to see you all today. Welcome. Hey, if you're a guest with us, so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. And if you're watching online, wherever you're at, glad that you are here as well. So today, it's a good day. Got a little bit of rain last night that we needed. Amen. We needed some rain. Six inches for some, I just heard. So that's wild. But let's all go and stand. As you stand, turn to someone around you, say, He is worthy. Just say he is worthy today. He's worthy. He is worthy. God is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our time this morning. Psalm 96 says this, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. He is the most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. In verse seven, it says, O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. And then it says, bring your offering and come into his courts. So this morning, as we gather together, as we come to give God praise, we want to bring an offering into his courts. We don't, we don't want to come to him empty-handed today, amen? We want to offer the Lord something from our hearts that would bless him, that he would see and say, man, I love what my children are bringing to me in worship and praise today. So let's make our heart's desire be to please him, to know him, and to worship him today, amen? And so church, why don't you raise your hands? And it's just us saying that we are surrendered to our God today. And so Lord, we come before you, we say thank you, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, enter your courts with praise. And today we say, have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts as we serve you, as we worship you, God. May you look at our hearts today and may you just be pleased. So uh, God, today as we gather as your people, may we be the people of God in the presence of God. May we pour out the praises of God in this place. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said... Amen. All right, church, let's praise him and worship him today. Here we go. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus today. We fix our eyes on you, Lord. All right, we sing. You carry the cross. You carry the cross upon your back. Your final breath, tears of blood, a crown of thorns, you gave it all, our sins you bore. What you've done, all oh, the power of your blood, 
was more than enough the sacrifice the change history the nails in your hands the heads that say me the grave was sealed and death lost its sting as the lion roared in victory for the sacrifice the change history the nails in your We sing thank you. Enter in with thanksgiving today, church. Oh, thank you for breaking the bread of your body, for spilling the wine of your blood. Oh, thank you. Oh, my heart will sing. Oh, we thank him. Oh, thank you for breaking.
clear that. Tell them church. Let's just take a moment just to rest in his presence today. God, hear our cry. We're desperate for you today. Make that true in us, God. God, may we be a people who expose, that we would expose our heart before you. God, we're not holding anything back today. We're letting you in. We're letting the light in today. You're all that we want. You're all that we need, God. Increase our desire for more of you, Jesus. Increase our passion for you. Increase our love for you. Because you're all that we need. The only thing that satisfies is you, God. The only thing that satisfies is you, you and only you. You and only you. You and only you. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Oh, hallelujah. Holy. Come on, 
church, you sing that. God Almighty, great I am, come to his, lift your voice, there's none beside thee, your God Almighty, the great I am. Thank you, Lord. your heart to him today church he's worthy he's worthy oh we give you our praise today you're worthy lord yes you're worthy lord the mountain shake the mountain shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stay. Oh! 
we sing it, church. Great. right now. Maybe not take that for granted. May we never take your presence for granted, God. Thank you. May our hearts continue to seek after you, to seek your face today, all that you are and all that you've done. We love you, God. All across the room, can we just say we love you, Jesus? We love you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. God's good. Amen. Can we just thank him again one more time? Can we just thank God for, for his goodness, his greatness? It's so good to be gathered as family and because we're family, families gotta know each other, right? So we're gonna take 30 seconds to meet and greet some people around you. Tell them your name, tell them you're glad they're at church today. Go ahead and start doing that now. Good morning, Central. Uh, this is one of those times in our year where we like to take a pause and reflect on one of our initiatives, and that is the next generation. We feel that God has put it on our hearts here at Central to serve the next generation and raise them up to know who Jesus Christ is, their Lord and Savior, and that they can live out in their schools and in their families their o this oikos principle that we love so much at Central. So today I'm here to uh, ask for two things. The first one maybe is that you consider helping serving in our next generation. And then the second is to be continuing to pray for our next generation. We are seeing that this is the loneliest and most anxiety-filled generation that we have seen come up in society. And at Central, we want to be a part of overcoming that with the love and grace of Jesus. That's the only way that that can happen. So we feel that the impact that when we can get adults surrounded with these kids that thing, great things can happen. So today we're looking at that. We're looking at the impact that you guys can have. And not only are you impacting the kids, you're impacting those that you serve around with you. So what's our ask? At Kids Central, it's really easy. Three hours a month. That's all we ask. Maybe you feel called to just rock and pray for our babies during the Sunday morning. Or maybe you love teenagers and you've got a lot of energy and you just want to be a part of having them being seen and known in this world. Or maybe you college is your thing and you still love being around college students. And if you're a college student here today, I want to challenge you. Can you be a hero for our little first graders and second graders? They love you. You can make a great impact and we would love to have you alongside of that. And if nothing else, we ask that you pray. We need God to be a part of this generation, and we ask that you pray for them. So we've got our entire next generation or next gen team out right outside these doors that would love to have a conversation with you. You're not signing up by any means to serve. It's just to start a conversation so that we can follow up with you. I want to share a story. We've had a, a volunteer that got kind of gently pushed into a girls group. <laughs> it was a dad. We were short and he started serving. And he noticed the impact that he was having and he said, I see what my daughters are learning and how I can help that and their friends and getting connected. But also it's changed my life. It's changed how I am a parent, how I'm a dad to my girls. Now that is awesome. You think you're serving these kids, but God is working just as much in our hearts as you serve. And that is what we love to hear. And that is what we want you to be a part of. We have an amazing year ahead of us. We're going to see over 1,000 kids inside of Central between students, college, and kids, and we need your help. 
because we're going to impact this generation. We can't wait to see what God has in store for this world through this generation. So what I want to do this morning is I want to invite you out to that table, but most importantly, I just want to spend some time in prayer. So will you bow and pray for, uh, be with me in prayer? God, I just thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the call that you've put on Central to be able to be a part of this next generation that's coming up, God. God, we pray for them. We pray as school is beginning and starting that you can be with them as their anxieties and fears and struggles, all of that stuff that rises up, that they can know you, that you can overcome that, and that we can walk alongside them. So God, I pray for the families that are here that are representative, and we're so grateful that we can partner alongside them of raising their kids. God, we pray for those that are maybe on the fence about uh, volunteering. God, just have a conversation that we can start. So be with them as that. God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that we were able to be here to worship you, to learn about you. And we just love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I look forward to meeting you out there. Have a great rest of the morning. Hi, I'm Pastor Nathan. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We're excited to begin our teaching time, but before we get to that, we want to mention something. Prayer is incredibly important to us, so if you have a need, write it down on the communication cards you were handed on the way in. You can put your prayer request and your offering in the box on the wall near the exits as you head out after the service. You can also use the link on the screen to fill out a digital communication card and prayer request. Thanks for being a part of Central's mission. All right, good morning, Central Church. How are you today? Awesome, awesome. If you're watching us online this morning, whether it's our Facebook Live page or our website, we're glad you're joining us. Those of you that are out in the concourse, God bless you. We're glad you're joining us today. Let me, let me just put my endorsement and stamp of approval on what John just said. This is your opportunity to not be a consumer, uh, but to be a participant, to, to not just sit in a pew and take up space. We don't have pews, but in a chair. Um, how many of you know what a pew is? Okay. <laughs> This is your chance to get in the game, and, and you've been here for a while, and, and you love the church, and you love the worship, and, and you, you love the teaching, you, you love everything about it. This is your chance to take what you're learning and to impact young lives. So let me just encourage you to get involved at, at a, a level, an age level that you feel a passion for, whether that's young children, children, middle school, high school, college, whatever it is. Man, get in the game. As we inch toward fall, this is when all of our programming really kicks up. And we need you to step in and do that. So just a conversation today. Go out and ask questions and find out a little more about that. All right. If you have a Bible this morning, and I hope you do, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. If you can find the New Testament, you're there. Matthew's the very first book of the New Testament. We're continuing our series called Extraordinary. It's a study in, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which covers Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your powerful presence here right now. And Lord, that beyond just listening to a teaching, beyond just reading the scriptures together, there are people here that desperately need a touch of God, that desperately need to know God is with them, that, that you're working. And so Lord, would you be personal right now in the lives of your people? For those that may be here this morning, Lord, that don't know you, that are here because a friend invited them or, or they, they just feel something in their heart toward um, God and maybe changing their life. Would you, would you draw them, Lord, into a place of understanding who you are and what you want to do in their lives? We thank you, Lord, this morning for what you're doing in every life. In Jesus' name, amen. At the beginning of this series, I said that the Sermon on the Mount uh, is like Jesus painting a picture for us, and we're illustrating it on this campus. Uh, he, he's painting a picture of what a true, uh, or a true follower or disciple of Jesus Christ is like. In fact, it's more specific than that. He's painting a picture for us of extraordinary character. And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, we're in the Beatitudes right now. As we go through this, it's really just the character of Christ. All we're seeing is a, is a picture of the character of Jesus, and that's what he invites us into, to live an extraordinary life of extraordinary character by the power of the Spirit of Christ who lives in us. And so we've been painting these, these little portraits of the Beatitudes, and we have a, a, a student in our, in our church, Jersey Olszewski, and she's been doing this every week, 
And so the first week was blessed are the poor in spirit, and the poor in spirit pray. So you see the, the praying hands. And the second week was blessed are those who mourn. They mourn over their sin. They mourn over the suffering in the world. The, the third week was blessed are the meek or the humble, and the meek take the last seat at the table. They don't push themselves to the front. Last week, Pastor Nathan talked about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and he talked about it takes time to do that. And so we're, we're continuing with this picture that Jesus paints for us of what a true follower looks like and what extraordinary character really is. Let's read together Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. One day Jesus saw the crowds that were gathering around him, and he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them, saying, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble or meek, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace or the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right or for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 11 make up a section of Scripture called the Beatitudes. And we've been looking at one Beatitude every week. And today we're just going to look at one more. It's verse 7, and it says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. This is the only Beatitude of all of them where the character quality is exactly the same as the reward. In other words, the merciful receive mercy. Um, so we're going to talk this morning about what is, what is mercy? What does mercy look like? It's a great question. I don't know about you. I, I get overwhelmed with the, the, the level of suffering that I see in people's lives around me. I mean, people are going through incredibly hard times. You may not even know everything that they're dealing with in their life. I was, I, I'm on a, a board, and one of the other board members was sharing with me a couple of weeks ago uh, that they, they just lost their first grandchild, uh, newborn, SIDS. Uh, their son went in and found the, the, the baby lifeless and, and unresponsive in the crib. They're heartbroken over that. Uh, she was sharing with me that her husband, a couple of years ago, was diagnosed with cancer uh, and has come roaring back, and he's in stage four cancer now. She's worn out as she cares for him. She would love to retire from her job, but she can't because now she has to work. They need both her health insurance and uh, her income in order to make that work. Uh, people around us are suffering, and we may not even know about it. I, I have several friends who are uh, suffering through cancer treatment right now, taking a toll on them physically and emotionally. Uh, parents more than ever now are watching their children suffer with mental health issues like never before. And so all around us, we're, we're struggling. And, and, and I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to get, to get overwhelmed with that. The word compassion means to feel someone else's pain. Compassion means you feel the pain that other people are feeling. But the word mercy means to step into that pain and help remove it. Compassion is identifying with and, and actually feeling the pain of other people. But mercy means you, you act. You, you step into that person's life with the hope of removing that pain or that suffering from them. Augustine, who was a, a fifth century uh, theologian and, and one of the church fathers, says, the merciful are those who come to the aid of the needy. The merciful are those who come to the aid. They get involved in the life of the suffering. When people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
They were not asking Jesus to feel sorry for them. They, they were not asking Jesus to feel bad about their condition. When people came to Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on me, they were asking him to change their circumstances. They were asking him to step into their life and remove the suffering that they were dealing with in their life. So I, I get overwhelmed when, when, I, when I come across suffering. And, and sometimes in those situations, I feel helpless and I feel powerless, like I can't do anything about that. So a lot of the times, I don't do anything except feel bad. I, I feel bad that they feel bad. And that's not mercy. Mercy is actually stepping into the situation and trying to bring change in their life. So I want to I bring some definition this morning to what mercy actually is. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who walk in mercy, for they will receive mercy. The first thing I want to share is that, that, that mercy is what God does because mercy is who God is. Mercy is what God does because mercy is who he is. Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is what? Merciful. The Lord doesn't just do merciful things. It's inherent to his nature. It's, it's, it's in his character. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. God cannot cease to be merciful. God can never be unmerciful. It's who he is. Mercy flows from him. We see God's works of mercy because that's who he is. He's merciful, period. The second thing is because of mercy in God, God pursues those who are suffering. Because of mercy, God pursues. Psalm 23, 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow, shall pursue. The word literally means chase. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me, chase me, pursue me all the days of my life. Because God is mercy, he constantly chases, pursues, follows, and gravitates to the suffering. He can't help himself. He is, he is a merciful God. And so he is drawn to suffering. He's drawn toward human suffering. He doesn't sit back and just feel bad when you feel bad. He actually steps toward it. Whereas we stay neutral or step away from it, God steps toward suffering because he's merciful. And God offers mercy for both temporal and eternal needs. Both temporal needs, that means the needs of this life and eternal life. And so we look in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, therefore, let's approach the throne of grace in prayer. When the writer says, let's, let's, let's come to the throne of grace, he's talking about the place of prayer, approaching God, coming before God. Let us approach the throne of grace in prayer with confidence so that we may receive what? Say it again. Mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. Those are daily needs. Those are physical needs. Those are earthly needs. Those are human needs. God is encouraging us to come with confidence before him because he wants to pour out mercy on the areas of our, our lives that need help because he's merciful. Come to the throne of grace with confidence where we will receive mercy. Why? Because God's merciful. He can't help but be merciful because that's who he is. And find grace to help in time of need. So, so God invites us to ask him for mercy for the, the everyday things of life, for his help. But he also invites us to ask for eternal things. So we read in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says, God saved us, not on the saved us from sin, saved us from eternal separation from him, saved us from a life and eternity apart from him. God saved us from that through Jesus Christ, not on the basis of our own good works. Not because we've done good things, not because we've given money to the poor, not because we've tried to live a good moral life, not because we're a good husband or a good father or, or a good friend, not because we do good things for people, not on the basis of any good works, but in accordance with his what? His mercy. His mercy saves us. I'll share this in just a minute, but he looked down upon our pitiful human condition in sin, and he had mercy toward us 
for our eternal need to be with him by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So God can't help but be merciful. It's who he is. God chases or pursues or follows the suffering because mercy always steps into pain and suffering. And God invites us to ask him for mercy for both everyday needs and the sufferings and the difficulties and pains we go through in this life, but also he asks us to save to be saved from eternal suffering. So, so Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. So what does mercy do? If we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to follow the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, if we're going to, if we're going to attain to the character of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit that works in us, remember, you can't do this in the flesh. This is a work of grace through the Holy Spirit. So, so we become merciful as we grow in the nature of Christ and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. So what does it look like? What does mercy do? What does it mean to be merciful? That, that's what I want to focus on just for our last few minutes this morning. So let me say this. First of all, mercy addresses spiritual suffering. Mercy addresses spiritual suffering. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6 says, but God, this is much like the Titus passage talking about uh, God's mercy in salvation from sin. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead spiritually because of our sin, God made us alive together with and through Christ. It's by grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God, being rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, stepped into our sinful condition. In other words, God looked down from heaven upon humanity, and he saw the fact that sin had separated us from God, and sin was leading us to a Christless eternity, an eternal life separate from God, filled with suffering. And God didn't just sit in heaven and say, oh, bummer, <laughs> sorry guys, that's going to be horrible when you go to hell. No, he, God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus Christ. And it says that Jesus went to the cross to save you from the suffering of sin. Jesus went to the cross to redeem you, to reconcile you or bring you back into a right relationship with God so you could spend eternity with him. That's mercy. See, the cross becomes the greatest symbol of mercy in the world because Jesus didn't stay in heaven and just feel sorry for you. He stepped into the world. He stepped into the sinful place of humanity, and he, and he was a substitute on the cross for us so that we could be delivered from our sinful suffering. He stepped into it, amen? I thought this week, what if, what if you and I were more like Jesus? What if we were more like God? Instead of when people sin, instead of when people mess their lives up, instead of when people sin in a way that we don't like, what if instead of heaping condemnation on them, what if instead of shaming them, what if instead of condemning them and alienating them and removing our, what if we stepped into their lives to remove the shame? What if we actually extended mercy? What if we became the church? And, and church, we're terrible at this in a lot of ways, at, at not lifting people out of the suffering and the shame of sin, but pounding them down in it, making them feel more guilty. What if, what if we became more like God and addressed spiritual suffering in people's lives? I want you to think for a minute about the time you've sinned the worst. Did you need anybody telling you that you sinned the worst? Did you need someone reminding you? Did you need someone punishing you for that? Did you need someone beating you over the head with that? Or did you need someone to come and be merciful and lift you up and help you walk through that painful, shameful, difficult point in life to get to the other side? What if we became more like Christ? in mercy. See, mercy not only addresses spiritual suffering, but mercy addresses physical suffering. Mercy steps into physical suffering. 
Philippians 2, verse 27, Paul says, indeed, he, and he's talking about Epaphroditus, who was one of his fellow workers in the gospel. He, he was working with Paul to bring the gospel to these towns and cities and villages where they were sharing Christ. He was sick to the point of death. He had a terminal illness. But God had what? God had mercy on him, and not only on Epaphroditus, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. God stepped in and physically brought mercy by raising Epaphroditus up from a terminal illness. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, it says, Jesus went on from there, and two men who were blind followed Jesus, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. They engaged Jesus. Jesus indeed restores both of their eyesight. He, he heals their blindness. And, and it says, that they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus had mercy by addressing their physical suffering. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could, like Jesus, just heal anybody physically anytime we wanted? Wouldn't that be great? Like we could extend mercy like Jesus did and just lift them out of their physical suffering, but we can't always do that. But does that mean we can't be merciful toward physical suffering? Are there other ways that we could help to lift people out of misery? So most of you know that we have a, a significant ministry in Ethiopia. And part of that ministry has to do with our, our, the two schools we sponsor with Adam's Thermal Foundation, K through 12. We're, we're really pouring into that. We, we partnered with the, the Timothy Initiative, and we're now planting hundreds of churches in Ethiopia. And, and people are getting saved and baptized every day through that ministry. But we're also getting into the interior and getting involved with different ministry partners. And we discovered that there was a government-owned orphanage in Ethiopia. And only orphanage by name because they didn't care at all or do anything for the kids. So babies are lying in their feces and urine for days. They're sick and they're not being attended to. And they're just dying. And nothing's being done for these kids. And one of our ministry partners there recognized this. And they are going to be taking over this orphanage. And so we are partnering with them and pouring resources into that orphanage to begin to get these kids in a healthy place. So how many of you know we can't go in there and just lay hands on everybody and heal them, but we can deliver them from their physical suffering. We can participate with Christ to pour our resources to begin to free them from physical suffering. Amen? Can you help people get out of physical suffering? We, we partner with another ministry here at Central called Call to Freedom. Uh, Becky Rasmussen is the executive director of that ministry, and Call to Freedom uh, gets victims of of sex and labor trafficking free to become survivors. And one of the things they have to do is they have to physically deliver them from their context and remove them from that so that they don't keep going back and suffering in abuse. So here in Sioux Falls, they built a house called Marissa's House where they can actually house women uh, and their children. Because if you don't get them out of that context, if you don't deliver them from that, they're not going to get free. So, so we are pouring resources into that to try to alleviate, alleviate physical suffering and emotional suffering for these young ladies and for their kids. So uh, apart from just praying for people, which we should, uh, to, to be healed or, to, or you know, to be restored, there are other ways that we can help people get free from physical pain, physical discomfort. Are you doing that? Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. They came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, have mercy on me. I have physical problems. And Jesus alleviated the pain. How are you doing that? That's part of our call as the character of Christ is to step into physical pain with the hope of removing it from their lives. The third thing is not only does mercy address spiritual needs and physical needs, but mercy addresses social needs. Social needs. So we're going to read a story about Jesus encountering some men with leprosy. Now, before we read the story, let me tell you about leprosy. Leprosy was a physical disease that had social repercussions. If you were a leper in the days of Christ, that, that disease was highly contagious. And so when you walked down the streets, down uh, the, the marketplace, you, you had to scream, unclean, unclean, so that people would know that you were a leper and they would get out of your way lest they come into physical contact with you and, and contract leprosy. So while, while 
Leprosy brought both physical and emotional pain. It brought social pain because they were marginalized in society and pushed out of society. Jesus comes across 10 lepers. Let's read the story. While Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, 10 men with leprosy, who stood at a distance, they met him. Now, they're standing at a distance because they're following social laws. They had to stay at a distance so that they didn't touch or come in contact with people. So they're removed from Jesus, and they're, they raised their voices, and they said to Jesus, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed of leprosy. The reason they went to the priest was the priest was sort of like the doctor of the town, and he would examine them, and if they were in fact free from leprosy or other skin diseases, then they could be brought back into society. They could be released back into a social context, whereas before they were just on the outskirts and marginalized. So when Jesus touched them physically, he not only touched them physically, but he touched them emotionally, and he touched them socially, and he restored them back into community. How many of you know we were created for community? We were not created to live outside of community. We're not, we're not created to live in isolation. We were created to live in community with people. We thrive in the context of community. Remove people from community like COVID did, and you've got a mess on your hands. When the church can no longer meet, you, 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 are, you are not doing what God created you to do, and that is to be with people to hug people, to love people, to shake people's hands, to be physical and emotional in that social context. We were created for that. Love is communicated that way. And so lepers didn't receive that. So Jesus restored that social life to them and removed that social suffering. So you're going to go out this week and you're you're going to encounter and engage your relational world, your oikos, And there's people in your oikos that are marginalized. There's people that are on the outskirts. And this is a family worship Sunday. So students, let me talk to you for a minute about the kids at your school. You're getting ready to go back to school. And there's going to be kids at your school that are outcasts, kids that are marginalized, kids that are made fun of. And maybe your extension of mercy is to include them in your friends group. Maybe your extension of mercy is to sit with them at lunch. Maybe your extension of mercy is to not allow them to be always by themselves, but in some way to restore them to some social health. And you adults, you're going to go into your relational world today. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to other places. Who are the marginalized? Are you inviting them into community? Are you inviting them into life, say, in the church or wherever? That's an extension. How are you going to fulfill Christ's call to be merciful with the marginalized? to restore social health to people. Instead of just being with your cool friends, instead of just being with your cool family, what if you invited someone that wasn't so cool to be a part of your life? That's called mercy. And Jesus demonstrated mercy to the marginalized. Mercy addresses spiritual suffering, it addresses physical suffering, it addresses social suffering, and it addresses emotional suffering in life. So Elizabeth, who was the wife of Zacharias, uh, who was going to be the mother of John the Baptist, before she got pregnant with John, she was barren, could not have children her whole life. And in that society, in the Jewish society, uh, your identity as a woman was determined by your ability to raise children, to bear children. And so if you weren't able to bear children, you were considered cursed by God. This isn't true, but that was the cultural feeling. You're cursed by God. If you're able to have children, you're blessed by God. Because there are scriptures in the Old Testament that say children are a blessing from the Lord. So if you have children, then you're blessed. But if you don't have children, if you can't bear children, you're not blessed. Well, Elizabeth was barren her whole life. So she's living in that culture where she's dealing with this emotional suffering, dealing with all of the women and the pressure in that society to have kids, but she couldn't. So she, she had real, no real sense of value in that community. So she's dealing with emotional pain. Here's the story. Uh, the Lord opens Elizabeth's womb and allows her to get pregnant. And when the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, she gave birth to a son, John the Baptist. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed what? His great mercy. 
toward her, and they rejoiced with her. The Lord stepped into her life and removed the emotional suffering that came in those days with barrenness in her life. Jesus didn't just feel sorry for her. The Lord didn't just grieve that she couldn't have children. He stepped into that situation and allowed her to be fruitful. Mercy addresses emotional suffering. Most of you know that my family, uh, the first week of June, ran a race in San Diego down at the Rock and Roll Marathon. Here's the whole clan. We were all down there together. And and my granddaughter Faith is in the lower right-hand corner leaning in there. And Faith gave me permission to tell this story. Faith's 12 years old, middle school kid, not a great runner, not, and she would tell you that. She, she, she trained a little bit for the 5K, and a 5K is 3.1 miles. So that day, uh, Faith and her two cousins, Tyler and Lexi, uh, my wife, Shirlene, and my son-in-law, Bo, all ran the 5K. And so they're all running, running hard, doing their best, and Faith comes around mile two, she finishes mile two, and she's laboring. And the last three quarters of, of a mile to end the race, it's kind of a loop around a park. So you finish the race by running down the street around the park and come to the finish line. Well, Faith finish, finishes mile two, and she's running, and she's laboring, and she's tired, and she looks 50 yards across the park and sees the finish line. And she decides, why run another mile when I can run 50 yards? So she does. So Faith scurries across the grass right in front of the finish line and crosses the finish line. And then her cousins finish, and we're thinking, she was behind her cousins. How did that all work out? And then we look at the time, and we put two and two together. No 12-year-old runs a three-minute mile. So we knew that something happened that wasn't on the up and up, and so mom pulled her aside, and she denied it and denied it because out of shame. And then, and then admitted it to her mom. I, I cheated. And her mom said, thank you for being honest. Um, here's what you're going to do. So somebody finished in first. She, by the way, she finished in first place <laughs> in her category. <laughs> First place. Yay me, right? (laughs) You're going to have to give the medal back. You're going to have to tell the race officials that you cheated and that you didn't finish first. And so there's that. And then you need to tell our family. Uh, You need to share with Nan and Papa and your cousins and your aunts and uncles what you did. And so that night, uh, she came uh, broken and shame-filled emotionally suffering as she faced her family, the ones that love her the most, and and shared what she did so that her family could run to her. So her family could step into her pain. So that her family could try to remove the shame that she was feeling. So we stepped in We hugged her, we loved her, we kissed her, we affirmed her, we thanked her for her honesty, we thanked her for her courage for doing that. What a a picture of what the church should be like. Because that's what Christ is like. When he steps into our emotional suffering, it's mercy. As you go into your world this week, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, those that are merciful toward the emotionally suffering because they'll receive mercy. God not only, or mercy not only steps into and addresses spiritual suffering and physical suffering and social suffering and emotional suffering, uh, but also mental suffering. Mental suffering. Let me wrap this up quickly. There's a story in Mark chapter 5 where Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man. I'm going to read that story to you and we'll close. Jesus and the disciples came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They went into the region of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, not even with a chain, because he he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart 
the shackles broken in pieces. He was demonically possessed and strong. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. He was suicidal. So, you don't have to be demon-possessed like this man was to be mentally tormented. The text says that Jesus cast these demons out of the man and they went into a herd of pigs and they rushed off the side of a cliff and it said there were 2,000 pigs, which meant there were 2,000 demons inside this guy. Can you imagine every day 2,000 voices saying, just kill yourself. You're worthless. You're, no one cares about you. No one loves you. No one wants you. Just take your life. Can you imagine every day at least 2,000 voices? That's mental torture. Here's how the story ends. Jesus delivers him, and Jesus is getting into the boat, and the man who had been demon-possessed was begging Jesus that he might accompany him. And Jesus didn't let him go with him, but he said to the man, go home to your people, literally go to your oikos, and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he had what? Mercy. You don't have to be demon-possessed to have mental issues. Uh, young people and, and older people are, are dealing with mental health issues at an all-time rate now. So if we, can't, if we just can't get into people's minds and free them, is there any way we can extend mercy? Well, we decided as a church, as we looked at our, the next generation and the struggles they were having, we were going to set money aside, which we did, for any young person in our church that needed professional counseling or therapy to help them get out of this, and we're doing that. So anyone in the church, any, any young person that needs professional help to try to get right mentally, that's one way that we're trying to be merciful and help them get out of that. We talked about the next generation earlier in the service, and I just want to ask you this. Would you be willing to extend mercy by stepping into the life of a child or a student or a college-age young person, stepping into their lives and helping them? What if that was the way that God was calling you to extend mercy in life? Our mission statement is here is we exist to help you Share the love of Jesus with your relational world. As you go into your relational world this week, how are you going to extend the love, not only the love, but the mercy of Christ with those in your world? How are you going to step into the pain and help free people from their suffering? That's what mercy does. Mercy pursues, follows, and chases suffering. Would you stand with me this morning? If you need mercy today, we're going to have some people up here to pray with you and to invite God's mercy into your life. But as you leave today, I want to pray that you'll be empowered with this scripture text. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Would you walk this week in the mercy of Christ? Let's pray. Lord, this is... This teaching is not just a standard that's unattainable to us. It's not just a goal. It's a quality of character that you have called us to live in. It, it's, it's possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, this week as we go into our relational worlds, help us to be merciful. Help us to step toward pain, not away from it, God, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you.